On April 7, 2021, well-known professional NFL player Philip Adams went on a violent rampage, shooting and killing six people. The very next day, during a standoff with law enforcement, he shot himself in the head and died on the spot. On December 1st, 2012, another NFL lineback named Jovan Belcher fatally shot his girlfriend nine times, drove five miles down the road before confessing his murder, proclaiming he couldn't be here any longer, and then shooting himself in the head as well. Going back to June 2007, world-famous professional wrestler Chris Benoit was responsible for a grisly three-day-long double murder-suicide in which he drugged his wife, bound her arms with cables and her feet with duct tape, and then suffocated her. The very next day, he drugged and strangled his seven-year-old son, only to later commit suicide by hanging himself. So what did these three cases have in common? All had signs of severe cerebral traumatic brain injury from repeated head trauma. In the case of Benoit, doctors showed that his brain was so severely damaged that it most resembled the brain of an 85-year-old Alzheimer's patient. Now, these are some of the most extreme examples, and obviously this kind of thing does not happen very often. However, the concept that repeated head trauma leads to severe brain degeneration in athletes has been well studied and is believed to be a major health concern which not many people know about. Not only does this apply to wrestling in American football, but also MMA, boxing, ice hockey, and any other contact sport. This is Elliot from EO Nutrition, and in today's video, we're gonna look at the effects of repetitive head injury on the brain and how you might be able to protect yourself against this. So if you yourself are involved in contact sports or you know anyone who's involved in that, then you need to watch this video. This also is gonna to apply to anyone who suffered traumatic brain injury from any other cause. Since the 1920s, it's been known that repeated blows to the head could cause long-term damage to the brain, with symptoms sometimes not occurring until many years after retirement. Back then, this was called punch-drunk syndrome and mainly associated with boxing. More recently, however, these findings have been expanded to include multiple different contact sports and is now known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This condition is known as a potential consequence of repeated concussion and is worth noting that there are an estimated 3.8 million concussions in sport reported in the USA every single year. Early symptoms can include irritability and aggression, memory loss, cognitive decline, depression, rapid mood swings and thoughts of suicide. Later symptoms can be reflected in severe neurodegeneration and can resemble late stage forms of dementia, even at a relatively younger age. One of the biggest issues with this condition is that symptoms usually don't manifest until several years after retirement. To make matters worse, it can only be diagnosed by examining the brain after death at autopsy. This means that many athletes could be experiencing these early symptoms yet become misdiagnosed. Although this condition is considered rare and it definitely doesn't affect everyone involved in contact sports, there is research over the past decade which has highlighted that the prevalence is probably much higher than previously thought. One study by Boston University CTE Center dissected the brains of 202 deceased American football players. Remarkably, they found brain damage in 99% of NFL players and 87% of all football players combined. A second study by the Mayo Clinic, which is the largest ever study performed to date, analyzed 750 brains and found a much higher prevalence among athletes compared with the average population. They estimated that 6% of the total population might be suffering with this condition. Furthermore, a third study found evidence of this in 12% of people with neurodegenerative diseases. Commenting on the first study, world-leading expert Dr. Anne McKee stated, The fact that we were able to gather so many instances of a disease that was previously considered quite rare in eight years speaks volumes. In other words, this disease is not rare among athletes but it just can't be diagnosed properly. One of the scariest things is that researchers even found that mild effects on the brain could cause clinical symptoms such as anxiety, depression, disinhibition, memory loss, and other mood and behavioral disorders. There've actually been several books written specifically on this topic, and although the NFL have done their best to suppress the information, 
They've paid out over $1 billion in compensation after being sued by retired players and their families. Lawyers are also making a similar case for other sports, including rugby. So to understand how we might be able to provide some protection against this, we need to take a brief look at what actually happens in the brain during head trauma. Acute injury to the brain causes damage via several different mechanisms, including a massive increase in oxidative stress and a depletion of cellular antioxidants. There's an impairment of mitochondrial function, meaning that cells lose their ability to make energy. There is also a deficiency of oxygen and relentless neuroinflammation. However, this can and should be short-lived if it's a one-time occurrence because the brain has the ability to heal. It's important to know that much of the real damage can actually be caused by secondary injury to the brain. When the brain can't properly turn down the inflammatory response, it remains in a state of perpetual neuroinflammation. And this is the danger with repetitive head injury. In this case, even mild head trauma can promote this chronic state of neuroinflammation and the brain can never return back to normal. These chronic changes are involved in the development of the long-term neurodegeneration that we see in chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This means that one of the most important areas to focus on is calming the immune system in the brain. Unfortunately, there's a lot that we can do in this regard. Important area to focus on relates to the brain's detoxification system. It turns out the brain has its own way of clearing out waste products and toxins, and it does this through what's called the glymphatic system. So if this glymphatic system gets blocked, then we end up with toxic waste products being stuck in the brain and they can't get out. This leads to secondary injury, which further worsens the problem. It's no surprise then that impaired glymphatic flow is thought to be one of the main drivers of brain injury after head trauma, even if it's mild. Quality of sleep and the circadian rhythm is one of the most important determinants of glymphatic clearance from the brain, but sleep is often disrupted after brain injury. Melatonin can increase sleep quality after TBI and works via numerous other ways to enhance neuroprotection. Another way to enhance glymphatic flow and counteract brain injury is through photobiomodulation, also known as red light therapy. In fact, this intervention also enhances brain protection via multiple different ways. This investment is really a must for any athlete who's prone to head injury or anyone who is suffering from post-TBI symptoms. For this, I recommend Violite, which is one of the best ways to provide light penetration into the brain. Manual therapies such as osteopathy, chiropractic, or massage with a key focus on clearing waste products from the brain might be one of the best ways to optimize this system as well. Furthermore, omega-3s are also going to be essential for reducing inflammation and supporting waste clearance from the brain. Omega-3s and their metabolites have been heavily studied in traumatic brain injury. Of these metabolites, specialized pro-resolving mediators are thought to be one of the main ways by which omega-3s are capable of halting the immune response. Fortunately, these can also be taken in supplemental form. A therapeutic ketogenic diet is probably also going to be very helpful in this situation and the potential neuroprotective benefits have been covered extensively elsewhere so I'm not going to cover that in this video. So there are a few other interventions which I would prioritize if I was in this situation. They all work via different mechanisms but they are really aimed at repairing injury done to the central nervous system. Injury can damage the cell membranes of neurons and phosphatidylcholine can help to replace and repair those membranes. N-acetylcysteine enhances antioxidant protection by improving levels of glutathione and in this way is protective. Lipoic acid works in a similar way and can downregulate the immune response. Brain injury inactivates key enzymes involved in energy metabolism, leading to an energy crisis. Thiamine in doses of several hundred milligrams can prevent this effect and preserve energy production in cells. Enhancing cerebral blood flow can be achieved using ginkgo biloba, although perhaps the most well studied for the purpose of brain protection in this context is Panax ginseng which I would say is probably the most essential. Ginseng and its related phytochemicals have been studied on numerous occasions in traumatic brain injury and have consistently shown positive results. To conclude, if you're an athlete involved in contact sports or even if you're someone who has suffered head trauma, the interventions and therapies that I've mentioned in this video are a must. If you choose to do this stuff as a profession or as a hobby, like I'm not trying to dissuade you from doing that, but what I'm saying is, is that you should very likely take precautions to protect your brain. 
at the very least, taking some of these nutrients on the days of activity or on training days might just help. Anyway, that's all for today, folks. If you like this video or you found it helpful, please like and subscribe, share it far and wide. And if that's everything, see you next time.